What's going on, guys? I was about to say Coach Ed Hockey Lab Podcast, but this is not the Hockey Lab Podcast. This is just Gary Roberts' performance. This good old-fashioned GRP. But what is going on? Welcome to our in-season training presentation. For the last few weeks, I've been talking to a lot of parents at rinks, at the facility. We've been chatting a lot about in-season training. You know, should you be training in-season? What should you be working on in-season? How do you balance work and rest and practice and all of those things? And so I thought it might be easier just to put together a little presentation, give you some tips, tricks, thoughts, ideas, principles, basically walk you through exactly how we think about in-season training and what we do with our players. We'll make this super applicable. So at the end, I'll show some workouts that we actually use with our athletes and I will show some training schedules and potential options for you guys. Look, in a perfect world, we would love for every hockey player to come work with us. We obviously work with a lot of NHL players, you know, some of the top dogs. We work with a ton of junior hockey players who are trying to make it there and a lot of younger elite players that want to make the jump and get to the next level. But it's unrealistic to think that every player could come work with us. So our goal for 2024 and beyond is to put out quality information that you could design your own program. You could consume our content presentations like this read our blog listen to our podcast the hockey lab podcast if you haven't listened please head over give it a listen and put together your own training program it's december right now while we are recording this so early december which means you've got five more months of this season to put this into into play and to start to implement an in-season training plan but if you're listening to this in the future if it's summertime you can start thinking about september october what you want to do how you would structure your your program and then if you are in the GTA area and you're an elite player who wants a little guidance and wants some help getting to the next level, we'd love to have you come into the facility, come do an assessment. Let's talk about your goals and see if we can't help you take that next step. So without further ado, let's pop into it. In-season training, get stronger and faster all year long. Little love to our boy, Quentin Byfield, who's having an absolute heater of a season to start off this year. You know, This is a young man that's put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of work. And he's been working with us since he was you know, 13, 14 years old. And we're seeing the fruits of his labor now. And he's going to be a, a star in the National Hockey League. He's really having a breakout season that is a testament to all the work that he's put in leading up to it. It is a process. you got to believe in it, trust it, work for it every day. Okay, a quick quote here. Kevin Neal is the director of performance for the Boston Bruins. In-season training creates a distinct competitive advantage as the season progresses. You have to train in season. I think it is undeniable, no doubt about it. And we're going to talk about why in this presentation today. Overview, we'll talk briefly about who we are. We'll talk about the state of the game. We'll talk about why in season training, strategies for success. And then, as I said, I will show you some actual examples. So you have an idea of how to structure things. All right, who we are, quick one, meet the strength team. Myself, Coach A, LL Speed, Lucas Lobo. B Dunks, Brian Duncan, Scary Gary, GR himself. Uh, this was from a this is from our Deck the Quads fundraiser, and it is December, so I thought Happy Holidays was in order. We've got a, a close knit, tight team. We've been together now for ten years, and what we're doing seems to be working. We've got three very different players, distinctly different players, and their styles of movement, their styles of play, and their performance are, are all unique to these individuals. So Darnell Nurse on the left, Brandon Tanov in the middle, Turbo, and then the SS Minnow, Steve Stamkos on the right. And then there's a quote from Friday Night Lights, which is one of my favorite quotes in that movie, where Preacher is sitting on the bench. Coach comes up to him and says, what do, you, what do you see out there? What do you feel out there in the field? And he says, they're fast, they're big, they tough, plus they fast. And the coach looks at him and says, yeah, you said that already, Christian. So the game has undoubtedly changed. It is getting faster. Guys are training. They're eating properly. They're taking care of their recovery. And we're seeing that out on the ice it's played so dynamically now that you can't afford to not be training properly if you want to keep up. There was a, a time, especially you know when Gary first started training, when that was a huge separator. Him and a few guys that were taking those steps and training in that manner, and everyone else was still kind of following that antiquated play golf, drink a few beverages, eat some chicken wings model. Now that's not the case. You know, training properly, taking care of your nutrition, dialing in your recovery is kind of the baseline level required to compete. When that's the case and everyone has raised their collective level, those small differences, those percentage points really start to matter. And that's why it's so important that you're following something that is 
designed to you and something that is going to help propel you ahead of your you know teammates and opponents that you're competing against hill to die on in season training may be my hill to die on so strength training is not just about lifting weights or putting size on it's an essential part of athletic performance and we don't want to waste our off seasons we've been talking about this concept now for for 10 years and i i think that the total volume of work on the ice, both from a team perspective and a skills perspective, has continued to climb, which has made it more challenging for players to train in season, right? There are more demands on their time. Players are, are very programmed, arguably over-programmed, and it makes it very difficult to prioritize in-season training. And that is the, the wrong attitude and the wrong approach to take. I really believe that. If you are going to find long-term success in hockey, you have to be training regularly. We're putting more and more emphasis on, on this with our players, both at a professional level and all the way through the minor hockey level. And as a younger athlete, you actually have an opportunity to make gains during that period. So if you're an older athlete and you've been training for longer, you know, your in-season might be a little bit more about maintenance. If you're a younger athlete with a lower training age who's still going through growth and development, you can make huge strides in your strength, your power, your speed during the season itself. So I want to talk about this, this little graphic here. Don't waste your off-season consistent progress over time versus stop and go yo-yo athlete. And this is something that we think about from a dieting perspective often, right? I eat well and then I reward myself by eating well, by eating poorly, and then everything crashes, and then I get back on track, back on the rails, I eat well again, up and down, up and down. And we know this, like I said, from the dieting world with fluctuations in weight and that sort of thing. We also see it inside of training, especially with you know, executive clients. They're not consistent in their training, so they train hard for a period, they go on vacation, they don't train hard, don't train hard, don't train. So instead of getting this you know, somewhat linear line where you're always making progress up and to the right, we get this series of peaks and valleys. So if we, if we look at the bottom of our graph here, the left axis we can disregard, but the bottom of our graph, you know, off season one, in season one, off season two, in season two, off season three, in season three. So that's a three year cycle for an athlete. Now that's, that's from, let's call it U13 through to U16, some pretty important years if you're a young player. We are making upward progress. There's no doubt about it. We are slowly getting better, but every in-season we're detraining and losing some of that progress that we gained, which means we need to spend the first segment of our off-season trying to build back up just to baseline, right? It's a, it's a huge problem and it's limiting your development and really slowing down your progress as an athlete. So is it true that if you don't use it, you lose it? If you're, a, if you're a parent, this, this graphic probably makes sense to you and you understand the reference. If you're a kid, it's, it's a movie that you probably haven't seen. But the principle we want to talk about here is residual training effect, RTE. So the idea is, is that if you don't use it, do you lose it? RTE, residual training effect, this is how long you benefit from prior training after you stop doing it. Okay, so if I am working on strength development and I stop strength training, how long will I maintain that attribute? And we see a series of different attributes on the left-hand side. So oxidative energy system, strength, glycolytic energy system, repeat power, ATP, CRP, and speed. We're not going to get into what these are all are specifically. The one that we're going to look at just for just for ease of understanding today is strength, right? So strength may last 30 days plus or minus five from the time that you stop doing it. Speed, on the other hand, five days plus or minus three. So there's variability among the attributes, but the sport, hockey itself, provides some great opportunity to develop some of these attributes, right? Speed, we're getting that top end speed all the time when we're playing. Repeat power, same thing. We're on the ice, we're off the ice, we're exploding. So we are continuing to reinforce and develop some of these characteristics inside of the sport of hockey, but others do not get touched because of the nature of the game, strength being one of those major ones. So at the end of August, you know, our young players leave us August 26th typically. If they don't do anything by November 1st, when the season's just starting, they've already started to see a decrease and a decline in their strength numbers. So they put in all that hard work to develop and improve. They did nothing for the month during training camp except for skate. And by the time the season starts, they're already taking a dive. That just gets worse and worse and worse as the season progresses, right? Now, now it's the start of December. We haven't trained in 60 days. 
Okay, so it's going to be pretty tough to get through Christmas time. Now it's the start of January, into the new year. We haven't trained in 90 days. And you can see how it just causes a negative cascade as we play it out over time. Let's talk about some of the benefits of training in season. So one of them is obviously performance, and we talked about that. But there's some other benefits that you should be made aware of as well. So core benefits. These are the impact that training has on our bone, connective tissue, and musculature. We lift weights, we increase bone density. We do proper eccentric training. We can improve the connective tissue strength, so our tendons and ligaments. So we hear things like MCL, ACL strains. Proper eccentric training can help to mitigate the risk of those occurring. And then the last component, of course, is musculature. So are we, are we straining our adductors? Are we straining our hip flexors? Or are those strong, resilient, ready for us to go and play and execute each and every day? Uh, contact versus non-contact injuries. Of course, contact injuries are going to happen. Hockey is a contact sport. It's violent. So we are always at risk of injury through contact. But what we really want to make sure we do is mitigate any non-contact injuries. So those are often soft tissue things like groin strains. If we're training regularly throughout the in-season, we're going to substantially reduce the likelihood of non-contact injuries. In fact, in a couple of different studies they looked at, it appears that you can decrease the likelihood of all injuries by one to two thirds and cut overuse injuries, which are often the non-contact injuries we're talking about in half. And I think that's pretty substantial considering how much time players are spending on the ice. If we can cut the likelihood in half, we've gone a long way of keeping players in the game and ready to perform. And then the last component of injury to reduction is just using that training as active recovery. So hockey players on the whole aren't great when they get time off. And this is something that we've noticed. They don't feel great when they go back on the ice and their bodies feel sore and sluggish. So we can use in-season training as a means of improving our performance, but also as active recovery for the next day. The last component that I want to talk about is maintaining weight. You know, so many young players come to us with the goal of increasing their weight during the off season. They spend time focusing on their training and their nutrition. They put that weight on, you know, it's giving them a little bit more power in the corners. They can push guys around in front of the net. They don't get moved around and bumped off the puck as much. If they stop training and stop following their nutrition program, they're going to see a decrease in that weight. And, you know, if you put on six or seven pounds in the off season, I think it's pretty frustrating to lose three or four during the season because you didn't take care of the things that you should have. It's just an unfair advantage, quite frankly. Like Kevin Neal said at the start of this, if you train, you will create a gap between you and your teammates and your opponents that they won't possibly able to catch up to. Everything in life revolves around the principle of compound interest. It is the greatest principle in the world. And by training consistently month after month after month after month, you build up so much compound interest that someone who doesn't do that can't possibly catch up to you. Okay, so let's talk about our in-season training principles. Consistency is king. We want to train full body. We want to keep the volume low, plan around important games, and be adaptable. Consistency. Gary talks about this a lot. He never went more than three days without training when he was playing. That's as a As a National Hockey League player, even with all their travel schedule, he always made sure that he was hitting it on a regular cadence. So when we get out of the habit of training, that's when we start to get really sore and fatigue starts to be a factor. So we want to get two to three lifts in during the week, ideally two really solid strength training lifts. And then we can get, you know, another two to three recovery focus sessions in. We don't want our training to impact our on ice performance. We don't want to go out on the ice and feel sore, you know, sore hamstrings, sore hips, upper body, feel like we're tight, restricted, like we can't move with the puck. And that only happens when we get detrained and then try and pop back into it. At the end of an off season, you've built up a ton of resilience to training. And it takes a lot at that point to make you sore. We can just keep that running, keep getting the benefits without feeling that overwhelming fatigue that that occurs when you take time off and then get back into it. So consistency is king. Next one, train full body. We want to ditch the bro split in season. There should be no upper body days versus lower body days versus arms versus back versus shoulders versus legs. Uh, There's a time and a place for that. In season, we want compound lifts, supersets and trisets. We want to get lots of work in in a short period of time. And we want to be really intentional with our warm up. So use those as prehab rehab options. But every session for us in season is full body. It might have an emphasis on one body part or one area more than the other, but We want to make sure that we hit everything because we're getting a limited number of exposures to training. Watch this volume. Not every session needs to be a marathon. This is just a good takeaway in general. 
I think sometimes when players try to do more, they just end up spending more time in the gym and that's not necessarily a recipe for success. You want to get in and out 45 to 60 minutes tops. I mean, some of our sessions will be 35 to 40 for some of our players and two to three sets per exercise, you know, six to eight reps that can go a little bit lower too, for sure. We can work in that three to five range. If you're comfortable, you have a good training age, you're strong and confident. If you have a lower training age and you're not as confident with your lifts, I would say six to eight. That's a bit of a safer range. The load's a bit lower, but it's still not super high volume, so you're not going to be fatigued out. Okay, plan ahead. This is a huge component of finding success in season. We want to plan our training around our competitions. We want to take time each month to set up a plan for that upcoming month. It should be written in pencil, not in pen. You know, the next point that we have on here is being adaptable so things can change, but it helps just to have some some thoughts on what you want to execute on during that month. So post game, if possible, typically allows for the maximum recovery window. So if you train immediately after your game and you don't have a game the next day, you will probably get the largest window of recovery. That's not always possible, but it's something that a lot of our pro players do. And I wanted to mention it. Typically we want, it should say 24 to 48 hours, but 25 to 48 hours before a big competition but if you have to decide between training inside of that time frame, so training 24 hours before or not training, I would say train. Training is the right answer. We just want to use the next point, which is, which is to adjust the intensity and volume based on schedule. And then the last component is take advantage of breaks in play for mini training camps. So with the Christmas season coming up, let's say you have two weeks off. That's an opportunity for you to get into the gym and really hammer down. Still take rest in between, still recover, but you can focus on some things that you wouldn't normally focus on for fear of being sore. So you could do some more eccentric work, work on that connective tissue strength and not worry if you're sore for a day or two because you don't have to play and compete. Okay. Last component, be adaptable. The only absolute is that you must train. You have to train. We just talked about that. But from that point on, you want to embrace variability in training. You want to base that on your body, your fatigue levels, your gym access, your practice load. So if we have a plan A, we also have a plan A1, A2, and B. And we do this with our athletes when they come in. So everyone that comes in to train with us at the facility has a program. And this is best case scenario what we would like to hit. But we will be dynamic in our programming and switch that up. They come in and say, oh, I had this happen. You know, Maybe I have a little hip flexor issue going on on my left side. Okay. Let's make some changes to the program. Let's make sure you still get the benefit, but we're being conscientious of that. Or they come in and say, someone's fired up to be on the ice. Or they come in and say, they're really sore and beat up. Okay, well, let's go to A2 now. What's our A2 training plan? And if you don't have a coach to work with you, that's no problem. You can just do that on your own. All right, let's get into our sample days. This is sample week one. So we've got a game day on Wednesday and Saturday in this example. So looking at this, we'll start our week with Saturday on our last game day. We played on Saturday, Sunday, that's game day plus one. So one day after, maybe we have a team practice. We want to look at either recovery or a full body session, depending on what's going on. Monday, now at this point, we're two days until our next game. Maybe we have an on-ice skills session, power skating. And this is, this is a mock schedule, but it kind of mirrors what we typically see with our athletes. So a recovery workout might be a better option on this day. Tuesday, so one day leading up to the game, now we're going to do a primer lift. And we'll get into what all three of these are. I'll show you guys some examples. Heading into our game on Wednesday. So now we've trained on Sunday. We've trained on Tuesday. We've done a recovery day on Monday. We play now Thursday plus one. We're going to do another recovery lift. No practice. So, you know, a little bit of a lower day. Friday, we've got team practice. We play in one day. So we'll do another primer lift. So in this instance, we got three in-gym training sessions in, in one week. This is what we just ran through. You guys can take a screenshot here if you want. Recovery full body sessions you know, varies depending on the athlete and the intensity. Tuesday, Friday, we talk about the primer training sessions. So these are designed to wake up the central nervous system and prime the athlete for competition. Like I said, we'll show you some examples, but they're short, low volume, high intensity training sessions that should have the athlete feeling fresh and ready to go. Sample week two, we've got a little bit more of a college schedule here. So we're playing Friday, Saturday. So we're using Sunday as our game day plus one. So one day after the game, we're looking at a recovery option. Monday, two days after team practice, we've got nothing on this day, but you could certainly do a full body session as well. That would be a great option. But if you're feeling a little run down, like you need a break, no problem, take some rest. Tuesday, we're three days away from a game. We're doing a full body session. Wednesday, 
two days away, we're doing a little recovery option. Thursday, we're getting our primer lift in, and then we're rolling into the weekend and we're playing Friday, Saturday. The only change that I would add on here that we didn't put in, if possible, I would probably look to lift hard on Saturday after the game if I could. I know you're coming off a back-to-back, you're a little bit tired, but you know, a 30-minute lift right after the game would get a second, would actually get a third session in during the week, which would certainly help, but it would still offer a pretty significant recovery window because you don't play until that next week. Same thing here. If you want to take a screenshot, we just talk about those same principles from the page previous. Okay. So now we're going to get into a few sample days. We have three different tri sets. So we've got a box jump, a bear crawl, half kneeling windmills for our first one, a bit of a primer set. Then we're getting into squatter trap or deadlift, band pull aparts, glute bridge pullover. The volume on the, on the B1 lifts or a squat and trap bars relatively low. We're looking at four to six reps, band pull aparts and pullovers a little bit higher, more of a corrective ac- action and exercise. Then C is dumbbell incline press, three point dumbbell row and a side plank. So if you look at this workout, we've kind of hit on almost everything. You know, we've got a push, we've got a pull, we've got a lower body action, we've got some core, and then we've got a little bit of corrective work. So that's a sample full body day. Next one, getting into our primer lift. This is a sample primer day. Before I continue, all of these occur after a good quality warm up. So we never hop into a workout cold. We spend that 10 to 15 minutes working on our warm up. And during that time, we can layer in our prehab and rehab. So that's a way to get some extra touch points on things that we might need a little bit more work on. So on our primer day, we're starting that off with 15 meter sprints. We're doing three to five of them. We want to be fully recovered from each of those sprint. So walk back, take your time, let your heart rate get down nice and low and then accelerate again. Like I said, we want to make sure we're warm. We're sprinting fast. You know, that's a, that's a higher risk activity. So good warm up and keep that distance nice and short. If 15 meters feels too long, we can shrink it down to 10 or 12. After that, we're popping into our lift. So rear foot elevated or split squats, lateral bounds, chest supported dumbbell row and mobility of choice. We're getting a little bit of power. We're getting a little bit of plyometric work in here and then some upper body corrective. As a hockey player, you're always rounded forward. So anything we can do to kind of pull that shoulder blade complex back and develop some posture can go a long way. And then our last day, uh, sample day, here's our recovery day. So this is the this is the lowest intensity of all three of these days. Primer is probably the highest. Our full body days are medium and then recovery is the lowest. So we'll start with a moderate to low bike ride or something of that nature. If you like to walk, you could certainly go for a walk 30 minutes, you know, pick a brisk ish pace. We want to elevate that heart rate up a little bit, 130 to 145 probably, but nothing crazy. After that, we'll come back. We'll hit two sets of alternating reverse lunges, yoga pushups, glute bridge walkout, and prone blackburn. So just a little bit of everything, touching on different movement patterns, different body parts. On this one, I would say no weight um, or lightweight, moving through a nice full range of motion, you know, taking your time, grabbing a sip of water as you go through it. And then you could follow this up with whatever additional mobility or stretching that you want. So putting it all together, just to close it out for you guys here, three key aspects of it. The first is trial and error. You know, you need to be your own detective. You need to figure out what works for you and your body. You need to play with different things and, you know, not be afraid to, to feel a little, little off on the ice. Maybe you tried something, you didn't like it. Okay. No problem. Write it down. Know what you didn't adjust for the next time. If you never try anything, you'll never know what works, right? Nothing changes if nothing changes. So we want to use trial and error to help develop the optimal routine for us. The next component is track and test. If you're not tracking, you're guessing. So make sure you're writing down your weights, writing down your workouts and, you know, kind of testing it both on the ice and how you feel. And then also looking at some additional performance tests to make sure that you're trending in the right direction. And then the last component of this, I would say is hire a coach. So if you, if you are in an area and you have someone that you can work with and there's someone that you think does a good job and you feel comfortable with, I would hire a coach outsource this to a professional that knows if you're in the GTA and you want to come work with us, head over to the website, GaryRobertsPerformance.com, fill out an intake form and yeah, we'll hop on a phone call. We can chat about it. Uh, Otherwise you can send an email to train at GaryRobertsHPT.com. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate the time. If you have any questions, like I said, fire them over, train at GaryRobertsHPT.com. Good luck with your in-season training. Stay strong, stay fast, dominate.